I'm Mike Manville, as Jen said. I'm a professor over at UCLA, and I'm going to introduce uh, our speakers and then uh, rigorously hold them to time uh, so that we can have asked them plenty of questions uh, on, their, on, their, on their presentations. And so this session is titled Mobility, Technology, and Travel Behavior. All right, so our next speaker is, uh, is Bo Lu, who is a PhD candidate at UCLA, and he will be uh, giving a talk on, uh, on parking. I'm just kidding. <laughs> on, uh, <laughs> on planning for sustainable transportation through integration of technology, public policy, and behavioral change. Thank you, Mike. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Bo Liu. I'm a PhD can candidate in urban planning at UCLA. Um, as an environmental scientist and planner, I'm very passionate about um, the energy and environmental aspects of transportation. So in my dissertation, I argue that the transition to sustainable, transi uh, sustainable transportation requires the integration of technology, public policy, and also um, mechanisms to promote behavioral change. Um, so the decarbonization of the transportation sector requires not only decarbonizing the fuels, decarbonizing the vehicles, but also decarbonizing our travel behaviors. In my dissertation, I seek to answer um, questions that planners and policy makers are facing uh, towards different stages of technology adoption. For example, right during the early stage of a technology, how sustainable are those options, um, not just environmental impacts, but also um, social and also economic impacts. So when certain technologies are being adopted, why and how uh, people tend to adopt to them or, or, or um, even at the societal scale? Um, and then when, when um, certain technologies are being largely, um, are being deployed at a larger scale, um, is our, our current infrastructure systems have the capacity uh, to uh, accommodate the changes. Uh, for example, do we have enough in infrastructure and what are some additional infrastructure needs? Um, and throughout this, this whole process, uh, planners are al always ask, um, how are we going to facilitate behavioral change? Um, so in my dissertation, um, given the fact that I only have a few years in the PhD program, and the fact that um, technology adoption can take years. So instead of looking at one set of technology, I actually looked at uh, three different sets of technology that represents um, different stages in their economic maturity. Um, so for example, in the first essay, I look at um, converting technologies that can convert waste into um, advanced biofuels and look at their environmental impacts from the life cycle uh, perspective. Um, that's towards kind of like early stage uh, um, technology adoption. Um, and then in the middle, I have um, plug-in electric vehicles. I look at the adoption behaviors within the state of California at the sensor track level um, using this machine learning techniques to find out what factors may have contributed to the um, kind of like right now this um, um, growing popularity in, in PPEVs. Um, and then in my third essay, I look at battery electric buses. This is because California has this statewide innovative clean transit policy, um, which by 2040, we'll, we'll see um, a 100% full electric transit system in the state. So uh, that's more towards like a longer term, um, more, um, more kind of like uh, accepted technology and for that, I look at the infra infrastructure needs. So given the tie, uh, given it's tied to the theme of this, this session, I'm gonna only focus on the second essay, which is, look, which is um, understanding the differences in growth across California PEV market from 2010 to 2018. So a quick overview about the PEV, about the electric vehicle market, which actually includes uh, conventional hybrid. So something interesting here is that um, towards the end of um, 2018, um, for the first time, um, battery electric vehicle 
Uh, the mon monthly sales of battery electric vehicles, BEV, has surpassed uh, conventional hybrid for the first time. And tourists, uh, and actually by December 2018, so both plug-in hybrid electric vehicles, PHEVs and BEVs, uh, surpassed conventional hybrid on the monthly scale. Um, but overall, the, if we look at the EV stock uh, by different types of ele ele electric vehicles, still conventional hybrid is still kind of like more than um, the plug-in electric vehicles. So here I'm showing you a map of the regional differences uh, across the three types of um, plug PEVs. So the first one is the overall, and then the second one is BEV, and then third one is PHEV. Um, so as we can see from those maps, um, there is some regional differences. Um, so that's kind of like the motivation for this work. I'm trying to understand what might have affected those regional, regional um, variations across the California market. So in the current literature, there are three sets of factors that uh, scholars found um, ha having effect on PEV adoption. Um, the first one being consumer characteristics. However, scholars have found varying and inconsistent effect towards that set of categories, uh, that set of ca that, ta that category. Um, and then the second and third uh, category being regula regulatory and financial incentives and also the, the availability of uh, charging infrastructure, which scholars have found consistent and positive effects on PV adoption. So why have we seen that such inconsistent and varying effects, especially on the uh, consumer side? Um, there, there are several reasons. The first one being a lot of the um, previous research have focused on the intention or interest to purchase um, and also willingness to pay, but those behaviors are actually intentional and doesn't um, um, really represent actual adoption behaviors. So which speaks directly to the second bullet point here is this um, intrinsic downside of stated preference approach, um, especially the valid validity of results, the sampling um, biases and survey design. Um, and also uh, there's another reason that um, adoption behaviors may vary across different groups and across different geographic locations. Um, um, and also with this model-based inference, there are some issues with that as well. Um, in addition, different PEV types, for example, BEV and PHEV, people may buy them for different reasons. That's why um, some scholars suggest we should look at them separately instead of looking at, looking at them as a whole. Um, and more importantly, att attitudes also tend to change over time. When, it, when a technology is being more um, introduced and advertised uh, throughout the process. So um, in this um, study, I'm trying to answer a few questions. First being, how different, how different is, the, um, is, is the market across uh, neighborhoods? Um, and also, what explains the, what might explain the regional variations in the different uh, categories of PEV adoption. In order to answer the questions, I, I, I tend to use algorithm-based inference. Uh, in this case, I used um, uh, lasso regression, which is uh, similar, kind of like a similar idea to the con traditional model selection, but using more kind of like a machine learning um, um, type of framework. Um, so f I, I incorporated um, 298 um, predictors. Um, uh, spanning from demographic information, economic, and geographic variables of, um, at the census tract level. Um, and or, also I, I have um, 78 and 13 observations. Um, so these are the uh, predictors I, I have included, and those are the data sources um, for that. These are some results I have. Uh, first, if we look at um, P PEV adoption across um, sensor tract quot quotiles. Um, so this being the top um, quotile um, organized by um, income, um, household, medium household income of the census tracts. Um, 
And then about two thirds of the PEVs are currently located in the top quartile, and a, a quarter of that are in the second quartile, with the um, like less than um, 20% in, in, in the third and fourth quartile. So if, 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 I, if I, this is when I organize this by um, disadvantaged communities, if we look at where vehicles are in disadvantaged communities versus non-disadvantaged communities, the definition for that is based on um, the CalViral Enviro, Cal Enviro screen developed by California Environmental Protection Agency. So like more than 90% of PEVs are currently located uh, within non-DACs. So um, this, this is also something um, a, a lot of the policymakers are interested in since we have this um, obligation to spend the cap and trade fund in those communities in order to um, achieve broader sustainability. Um, so here I'm going to just quickly show you some results about uh, all the models I found through the algorithm I had. Um, so in this case, um, I first look at PEV as, as a whole, instead of looking at um, PEVs and PHEVs separately. So for the, for the PEV models here, so the best model I found through the algorithm actually contain um, a, a, at least two variables, two predictors, and it also has as many as 17 variables in, in one of the, the other models. Um, so based on this, um, a general implication is that um, economic variables are more important in PV adoption. Um, so the numbers in the numbers in parent parenthesis are um, the amount of variation a particular variable can explain across um, out of the overall variations. Um, so if we if if we look at the effect, for example, like the medium um, household income, it has a way larger effect than other variables. Um, and also, um, in terms of the amount of uh, variation can be explained by a certain variable, we can also look at the house value uh, um, also stands out. So those two basically represents kind of like the economic um, power of, um, of potential consumers, which dominate in this case. So here are some results for uh, battery electric vehicles. So for this uh, category, I found um, like two to six variables out of the algorithm. Um, still, economic variables are very important for B, uh, in, in terms of uh, BEV adoption. But however, they do not explain as much of the observed variation as compared to the overall PEV models. And if we switch our focus to uh, plug-in hybrid electric vehicles, PHEV, we have more um, interesting stories to tell here, although the, the amount of um, the number of um, variables in being, in being included in the models are larger than, the, than what we have seen from the other two sets. Um, so there's a more diverse set of variables being selected in the process. And also, it, it, um, for, I, I just listed one model here just as an example. Um, actually, the amount of variation can be explained is way bigger than the other two sets. And also, we have interesting um, uh, variables here. For example, in this case, HOV lane does have a very does have a positive effect, um, whereas we I, I didn't find any effect from the, the other two sets of models. And also, there's other information. For example, like education um, has a positive effect and also using public transit and also, um, so we have a more diverse um, story here. Um, also within this PHEV models, um, they also in indicate that um, kind of like the middle age um, group are more likely to adopt PHEVs and also certain types of uh, professions or occupations tend to um, have more uh, tend to be positively related to um, PV, PHEV adoption. So, in the PHEV, 
PHEV models, I do find, I do find that um, neighborhood greenness, which is a construct for environmental awareness, d does have a positive, positive effect on PHEV adoption. So this is also uh, different from the other two sets of models. Um, so to conclude, the PV market in, in California has been growing unevenly. Um, and with the majority of PVs located in high income neighborhoods and also non disadvantaged communities. Um, economic factors have more predictive power for PEV adoption. Um, and this, this uh, is also true for battery electric vehicles. However, um, um, PHEV adoption is more likely to be associated with a more diverse set of um, variables. For example, um, education, commute characteristics, HOV lane access, and jobs. Um, so I'm going to quickly talk, also quickly talk about some future work. Um, so all the, all the best models across the three categories didn't capture any effect from charging infra infrastructure, which is surprising to me. Um, so I'm, I'm trying to, f to understand uh, what might have happened here. The first being um, the construct I have for charging infrastructure is only based on the number of chargers within uh, a 10 kilometer radius. So it might be a problem with the construct itself. It's not capturing the effect uh, with, the, with that uh, radius. Also, there's another possibility that currently in California, the majority of PV drivers have access to home charging, which they don't rely on um, public charging in, in other places. So, um, so I will have to look into more on that in order to understand what, what might have happened here. And also, um, especially for BEV adoption, right now the current, the, the models um, don't find anything from other than economic variables. So, and also, um, there might be something there with the constructs I have, or so maybe I didn't include enough um, other variables that might explain. Um, so I, I welcome any questions you have. Thank you very much. Did any of your research look into either the cost effectiveness of PEVs or BEVs uh, based on a, a similar conventional vehicle that was a uh, ICE vehicle, inter internal combustion engine? In other words, making the economic argument that it is cheaper to drive these overall than to, uh, you know, your, your uh, studies that show it was a higher income population seems to contradict that thesis. Um, yeah, that's, I, there, there is already um, a lot of work looking at total cost of ownership um, for, on BEVs com, um, in comparison to other conventional vehicles. So there's a study, I, I didn't do any research on this because I've seen a lot of research done in, in this aspect. Um, so there's the IEA, Global EV Outlook, they've looked at different cost scenarios and how that compares with um, conventional, elect, uh, uh, conventional um, ICE vehicles. They actually found that um, certain factors um, would um, affect the cost effectiveness. For example, like the amount of driving you have um, inter um, measured by like VMT, right, for example, um, and also kind of like the gasoline price in certain areas. So those are kind of like more um, factors affecting the cost effectiveness, uh, cost effectiveness, which I didn't really address in my work. Um, so one of the questions, I mean, study discrete choice models and uh, choice modeling particularly has this RUM framework and then you use them <coughs> to estimate uh, and then there's machine learning and giving data science. Uh, so do you see uh, machine learning and applying all of this and using a large amount of variables? Because what we're taught in general discrete choice model is your model being parsimonious and being able to explain behavior, that's good enough. But with machine learning, you can always parse more data and you know bring in much more richer insights. So do you still think like with, uh, maybe 70, 100 variables and then bringing them down or doing cross-validation machine learning approaches on this can still be used to explain what's going on? Or is it more like, okay, this is the data, it's explaining something, don't ask me why. So that kind of thing. Right, right. And also, even within this um, um, 
paradigm of machine learning, there are different techniques. So in my case, I only used one. So there are other um, techniques that I, 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 I am going to explore and find out how that how those compare with this particular technique. For example, there's also, uh, there's also other techniques like elastic net, net uh, rich regression, and also stratification, other uh, types of uh, boosting or random forest. So there are many, yeah, I, I agree with, with the, the kind of like this um, um, downside of uh, machine learning is that peop like uh, data scientists tend not to understand what's going on here, right? Given this um, convenience of algorithm-based inference without even, ha without having a deep understanding of what might have been going on there, just using these techniques to present whatever models they can detect. So that, that is, a, that is a, 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 an intrinsic um, problem with that. But um, as, as a planner, I think I would definitely look more into other um, aspects of it. I had a tiny question, if you don't mind. Uh, about the data, I mean, uh, how were you able to collect, uh, connect the PV registrations with all of this plethora of variables? Was that, like IHS market, I see that they must have provided you PV registrations, but what, did that come with like specific identifiers b which you use to connect the data from, or did you, oh, be, maybe because, was it an artifact that you did it on the census track level and that's why you were able to do it? So actually the version of data we get from IHS market is um, organized um, by census tract. So they actually give us each vehicle registration and followed by where um, the consumer is located at the sense track level. <clears throat> I have a, a comment and a question. And, and the comment is that uh, your graphic early on um, where you were giving us the sales of the different types by year, um, it's, way, it's way at the beginning. Uh, there you go. Um, I think it just would be fascinating to um, add the timeline of the different incentives that the state of California provided. So you would know when um, PHEVs were no longer allowed to be on HOV lanes and when the incentive, when the, um, the extra tax incentive changed and stuff like that. Anyway, I think that would just be kind of an interesting thing to do. Um, the question is about, um, how we interpret results. And that is, um, it's of course obvious that rich people buy more cars and own more cars than non-rich people, whether they're battery electric or not. And so I'm wondering if you had thought about sort of um, indexing your dependent variable to kind of look at the share of these types of vehicles in the census track as opposed to the numbers? Um, because right now, I think your big income effect is um, car ownership in general effect, or it could be. So my comment is about your, uh, your, your confusion about the, um, the charging stations. I mean, I guess the, it seems to me that they, that has to be an endogenous variable because the state doesn't decide where charging stations are by just throwing darts at a map, right? I mean, it puts them where it thinks people are going to buy cars, which means it probably puts them in places where people have a lot of money. And so your income could just be capturing charging stations in addition to the fact that now you can buy your own charger and things like that. Um, and then I think my question is, I wonder, and maybe just following on on the earlier question, if you could explain why you chose to do machine learning um, given that this in some ways just seems like something you could theorize out and do with a plain old regression and and that you know those of us who are old have been taught like the last thing you want to do is just dump a bunch of variables <laughs> into a computer and let it do your thinking for you yeah I think this is mainly because this um, um, 
based on the previous research, a lot of findings um, when a scholar found uh, varying effect or inconsistent effect from the previous studies, they always have a discussion about what might have happened there. So a lot of them actually mentioned that um, this methodolog methodolog methodological issues in, in, a lot, in a lot of their traditional modeling or regression-based uh, approaches. So, um, so that's, that's kind of like the motivation for me to kind of like try this, also with this emerging machine learning type of um, thinking. So trying to see how my results would compare with this traditional uh, model-based inference. So that's, yeah. That's just kind of like an experiment and to see. Um, I, I agree, there, there, there is the benefit of um, having a predetermined set of variables, uh, which um, actually also solves some of the downsides of machine learning. Um, so there's co cons and pros for each side. It's, it's kind of like, um, for me, it's more kind of like trying to see um, at the end and see um, how the results compare and uh, what can be um, what can benefit um, planners and policymakers who are doing uh, practice in the field so that's more kind of like that so yeah it would be very interesting to look at the share of electric vehicles um, out of total uh, or, or all types of vehicles um, the the issue I have here is uh, the data set only contains um, electric vehicles without other types like con conventional ICEs. Um, you right, right. <laughs> and the data set actually is very costly. Even for the PEV um, portion, it costs um, like fifty thousand dollars. But if you just year. if you just wanted to know total vehicles, you could get it from the census. The set, like the, the ACS just has how many vehicles are in the tract, and you could use that as a de denominator. Thank you for staying with me for this last afternoon presentation on a Friday. Uh, I hope you have some, can muster the enthusiasm for a presentation on bundled parking. Uh, my co-author on this is also the moderator, so all mistakes are mine. You can point them out at the end. Uh, so one of the big debates going on in the transportation literature um, has been over what is the relationship between the built environment and travel behavior. Um, now, it would be an overstatement to say that we can really agree on the mechanisms and the magnitude of the built environment's influence on travel, but we roughly have a consensus about broadly how land use can shape travel decisions. And in essence, the way that works is that the built environment can make travel more costly or less costly in terms of time, stress, money, um, and researchers tend to measure the built environment in what we call the five Ds. So density, diversity of land uses, uh, destination accessibility, distance to transit, and design of streets. So in very dense places with narrow streets and good transit access, um, that might make walking or using transit a lot cheaper. Um, if you're in a more suburban sprawling neighborhood with broad streets um, and destinations are far between and infrequent, um, then that would make driving a lot easier, but transit and walking more difficult. And so parking, by that reasoning, could really you know, sway people's travel decisions. Um, parking is a really dominant part of automobility. The benefits of using a car depend on where, whether you can park it. Um, and that's why parking is just a huge part of um, the built environment and it's the largest land use devoted to driving, um, to any particular mode, particularly driving. Um, so in lower density places where surface parking makes a much bigger share of land, um, parking makes up a much bigger share of the land. And in denser places that, have, that don't have that much parking, you're still going to be pretty, uh, buildings that don't necessarily have parking in them are gonna be located pretty close to somewhere you can park. Um, and so the study of parking has grown over the last, you know, couple decades, but it's still in a lot of ways a missing part of the literature on land use and transportation. Um, so we know how the built environment might affect travel behavior, but what's the role of parking in that relationship? Um, and that kind of makes sense because parking data are difficult to find. Um, 
And that's the purpose of the study, is to dive more into the relationship between parking and travel. So we're going to have a hypothetical situation in which you should imagine two different women who work the same job in the same office building, and they also lease apartments directly across the hall from each other. Um, the neighborhood they live in has really good transit connections. Um, it's a pretty walkable area. Uh, and the apartments are exactly the same way, except they have one important difference. One uh, unit comes with a parking spot included in the rent and down below in a nice garage parking space, and the other doesn't. So the first woman who has parking, she keeps it in the garage. The second woman has to store her car on the street. So every time she drives, she knows that when she comes home, she's going to have to look for street parking. And the real question we're trying to address is how much more likely is n woman number two going to be to take transit or to drive? And essentially, that's a question about the relationship between parking and travel behavior. And so what we're looking at when I say bundled, bundled refers to having the cost of parking included in the cost of housing. So that could be either be rent or the purchase cost of a home, rather than paid for separately by vehicle owners. Um, and bundling matters because it shifts the cost of driving into the property market, and that might lead people to make different travel decisions. So bundling is a lot more common in cities that require more off-street parking with development. And in really dense areas, um, these minimum parking requirements can force developers to provide parking spaces, um, even when that cost is a lot more than you know, the market value to provide them. Um, so in that case, bundling the cost into housing might be the easiest or only way for developers to recover those costs. So, uh, and it might also change a resident's perspective perception of the costs and benefits of driving. Um, now that your parking expenses are independent of how much you drive, um, you pay for because the parking is included in housing costs. And um, having your parking very conveniently located might affect how, definitely makes it easier to drive, and it can then potentially impact how you travel. So the costs and perceptions of costs. Um, there are kind of two broad ways in which the supply of parking can influence travel behavior. First, it just makes it easier. So if, I mean, most trips start and end with a parking spot, and most of the time a car is spent parking, um, and if par that parking is cheap um, and easy to pay for, then the overall cost of that driving trip really falls. And it can also, parking avail easily available easily available parking can make not driving more costly. If you have a lot of surface lots that push you know, other uses far further apart, then that makes transit less effective, and it makes walking more difficult, and e driving a lot easier. Um, and also, all of these, like even if you put all of the parking underground, you still have all of these curb cuts that pedestrians and cyclists have to deal with, and that definitely makes um, not driving more stressful and more dangerous. The l second large way that parking can offer uh, change, you know, your um, travel rationale is that it changes the cost and the uncertainty associated with parking near your home. If you know that there's going to be a parking spot by your house, it makes driving a lot more convenient, which I mentioned earlier. Okay, so. Um, the most obvious way that having bundled parking could change your travel is by maybe making it, uh, is by changing vehicle ownership. So if you don't have a spot that comes with your apartment, you might think twice about getting that second car. Um, but the research has already shown a link between um, vehicle ownership and residential bundled parking. So the purpose here really is to say, okay, even after controlling for uh, vehicle ownership, how can bundled parking potentially affect travel behavior? So if we looked at the two tenants that I mentioned earlier, 
The difference isn't that they own cars, they both own cars. The difference is how much more likely is the person without bundled parking going to be to use that car. If she knows that she's coming home late at night and has to circle the block maybe once or twice, maybe park further away, uh, and then the next day again have to travel further to get to that car or deal with street cleaning, um, is she going to be more likely to use transit? So to address these questions, um, ideally we would you know, have experimental data, but it's hard to just randomly assort people into unbundled and bundled units with similar socioeconomic characteristics. So instead we rely on um, data that we can observe people's observed behavior. Um, and we have the 2013 American Housing Survey, which luckily in that year contains a great uh, transportation topical module um, that has some pretty detailed information about people's travel choices. So we know whether they have uh, bundled parking, which is great. We know whether they use transit in various ways. We know, first of all, if they use transit at all, if they do, which mode of transit, um, how far a transit stop is to their home, how they get to that transit stop, how frequently they use it. Um, yes. We also, uh, unfortunately, don't have much information in terms of driving behavior. Um, a traditional travel diary would give us a lot of really great detailed information about like how many trips a person took in 24 hours, how far did they travel, how long did it take, what was the purpose of that trip. None of that is unfortunately in this survey. We have a very rough proxy for driving, which is like an aggregate monthly uh, gas expenditure for a household. Um, so again, very rough because you know so many things affect uh, how much, what, what might determine how much money you're spending on gas, right? The type of car you have, uh, where you live, your own dri driving behavior, and all sorts of factors. So again, this is very rough, and we really focus on transit in this study. Um, and we also have some great ways to measure the built environment. There's a lot of uh, questions about um, how accessible a neighborhood is. Can you walk um, to your nearest grocery store? Can you take transit to you know, the nearest um, healthcare facility or whatever? There's all sorts of um, built environment characteristics that we use to determine how walkable um, uh, is a neighborhood. Does it have good sidewalks? Is it well lit? Um, we also have a range of socioeconomic uh, characteristics that we can control for. Um, poverty status, household income, race and ethnicity, um, so those are all incorporated in the models. Um, so first is just like descriptively, like what does the data say? Uh, the thing that really jumps out is just how pervasive bundled parking is. Um, you know, 90% of US households have some form of bundled parking, which really isn't that surprising given that the typical house is a single family detached unit that will probably have a driveway or a parking garage. Um, and parking is more common in owned units than rental units um, and more common outside of central cities and are not in housing that was built uh, the, and bundled parking is less common in housing built before 1920 which also makes sense because that was pre-housing re uh, parking requirements. And then descriptively we can also see big differences in bundled versus unbundled travel behavior. So households with bundled parking spend uh, more than twice as much on monthly gas expenditure. Uh, so 230 odd dollars to over $100 for uh, bundled versus unbundled. And also bundled parking, bundled, unbundled units, housing units spend uh, almost six times as much on transit. So they're using a lot more transit. Um, yes. So then households without bundled units, um, without bundled parking, are also much more likely to use every single kind of transit that we look at, which is you know subway, commuter rail, um, the, the bus. And then also even among housing units that do take transit, bundled parking is associated with um, more driving. So people that have parking in their household are much more likely to drive to the transit station. And that's true for every mode of transit. You're much more likely to drive to that stop. Um, 
And descriptively, we see a big correlation between bundled parking, more driving, less transit use. And some of that might just be socioeconomic related. So you can see that um, households with bundled parking have a much higher um, annual income. So $49,000 for a bundled uh, household versus $32,000 for an unbundled unit. And also more than just income, it could be uh, the built environment that is impacting our travel behavior. So we do see that in neighborhoods that are more, uh, that make cycling and walking much more easily, easy, uh, uh, households are, unbundled households are going to be much more likely to uh, be in those neighborhoods. Sorry, that was poorly phrased. Basically in neighborhoods that are much easier to not drive, you're more likely to um, be unbundled. So overall, we see that unbundled, un unbundled parking is very uncommon. It's correlated with more walking and transit use, and also correlated with things that would really predict walking and transit use. So having a more accessible neighborhood, a lower income. Um, but again, this is all really descriptive. So let's see if we can kind of tease out these relationships with regressions to kind of get more closely at the relationship between bundled parking and travel. Okay, to the regression analyses. Um, so as hypothesized, we do find that bundled parking has a negative and significant association with overall transit use, bus use, subway, subway use, even after controlling for uh, vehicle ownership. And the bundled parking coefficients in the overall transit bus and subway models suggest that um, the decision to use these modes are strongly influenced by the presence of, by having bundled parking. Um, and one way that we can kind of uh, analyze the data is by exponentiating the coefficients of the regressions. So I'm not showing you all the regressions, um, but that gives us the percent change in odds of using a certain mode um, associated with a change in having bundled parking or not. So after doing that and controlling for everything else, um, including, I should emphasize, car ownership, we see that the odds of a household with bundled parking will use transit of any sort are 56% lower than a household without bundled parking. And that association is actually really large if we compare it to other associations. So for example, transit use and poverty, the odds of a poor household using transit are 23% higher than for non-poor households. So that's like less than half. Um, and almost as large as the association between transit use and a household adding another car. So every car is associated with a 58% reduction in the odds of using transit. Um, households with bundled parking have odds of using the bus that are 47% lower than households without bundled parking and have odds of using the subway or light rail that are 75% lower than households without bundled parking. So we can see that bundle parking is really strongly and negatively associated with a household having a frequent bus or subway user. Um, and specifically, the odds of a household with bundle parking have a frequent bus, bus user are 45% lower than the odds of a household without bundled parking. So now a problem with just using these, uh, calculating the changes in odds is that we don't really look at like, what, well, what is the baseline rate of use? Um, we see a percent change, but like relative to what? And we can address that by estimating the marginal effects of bundled parking on predicted travel use, transit use. So if we fix all of the um, continuous variables at their means and dichotomous variables at their modes, and uh, we can predict travel for households with and without bundled parking. So controlling for all of these variables in the model, a household without bundled parking has a roughly 1.6% probability of using transit compared to 7 tenths of a percent for a household with bundle parking. So that sounds really, really tiny, but that's also because transit use is incredibly rare in the US. And so the thing we wanna look at is really like comparing those two percentages, uh, which is pretty, that difference is quite large. So a household without bundled parking is more than twice as likely to use transit of any kind. That's pretty, you know, that's significant. And I'll just get to briefly the, uh, you know, proxy for driving, how might driving be uh, impacted? And again, uh, gasoline expenditure is a rough uh, proxy for the volume of household driving. But, and we control for a number of factors, including the sociodemographic variables and the built environment characteristics, and find that 
bundle parking is definitely significantly uh, is significant. Um, so a bundled household spends about forty-eight dollars less per month on gas than a household with bundled parking. Um, this was in 2013. Um, and that difference makes bundled parking one of the model's like biggest determinants of gasoline expenditures. Um, it's a, definitely a bigger association than having um, uh, than the combined association between gas spending and having good sidewalks, a walkable grocery store, and transit accessible banks. So pretty big. OK. So what we find is very strong evidence that bundled parking is associated with less transit use and potentially more driving. Um, that exists, that association exists even when we control for the um, vehicle ownership, as well as the built environment and socioeconomic um, factors. So broadly, our results highlight that parking is an important link between the built environment and travel behavior. Uh, and it really drives home the importance of, um, you know, questioning our long-standing commitment to, in policy, for requiring parking uh, with new housing. Um, if cities are really trying to uh, decrease driving, encourage transit ridership, then I think they should, you know, consider how parking requirements impact our travel decisions. Um, and, you know, there is definitely movement on that. Politically, we see, for example, just now in uh, Westwood, the North Westwood Village Neighborhood Council is trying to abolish parking requirements. Uh, in Elizabeth Warren's housing plan, she discussed the, how housing uh, parking requirements can increase housing costs. So it's definitely becoming a more mainstream discussion, and I hope that we can implement more changes on that. Thank you. I actually have a couple questions, but um, I'm concerned about endogeneity by your reliance on a binary variable or dummy variable of uh, bundled parking, because bundled parking in Manhattan is different than bundled or unbundled parking in, I don't know, uh, Huntington Beach. Um, as you mentioned, those five Ds, and so I'm wondering how you control for that in your research, or if you do? Yeah, I do. Um, so we control for uh, the like big six metropolitan areas, including New York and places that historically have, um, you know, are you know cities built around walking and not transit. So those places are controlled for, and then we also um, control for units that were built before parking requirements were really um, implemented. Okay. And um, as a consumer of housing, I guess I look at the end of the day at what my monthly costs will be, not at whether it was bundled or unbundled. So take, for instance, one property where I would pay $1,500 and it would be bundled but another property where I'd pay $1,400 and I could pay an additional 100 for a parking space. To me, those are equivalent properties because it's $1,500 total if I want parking. So does that dummy variable of bundled and unbundled, does that do justice when the person's end decision is potentially just the total price that they're going to pay? Uh, I'm wondering how you respond to that. Um, well, I guess we don't really know what their decision making was. What we can do is like kind of an aggregate control more uh, for s similar income levels. We're not really, um, yeah, I mean, that would be interesting to see how like when you're purchasing a home, how that affects it. Uh, I'm not sure that addresses the question of like how that in fact impacts travel behavior um vehicle owner like we do have literature showing that like having the bundle parking might affect vehicle ownership uh, in your studies uh i am a longtime transit user used it uh, my entire 30-year career however where i live there is no such thing as unbundled parking it does not exist at all it's a suburban home and uh 
uh, so it seems to me, being especially my own bias of living out there, is that there's, it's not a factor, there's no way to do it except in rental housing, which is probably under, under 30% of the neighborhood, of the area. Is that, is your policy issues simply directed toward rental housing or, you know, multi-unit housing as opposed to single family dwellings, which are very prevalent in Southern California, just not downtown? Yeah, I mean, I think you would want to first focus on areas that have our transit rich neighborhoods. Um, you're really, uh, by tr parking requirements or something that really lower how much we can actually, how densely we can build a housing structure, right? And so, and not only are we then uh, reducing the density, but we're also encouraging uh, driving by providing this parking. So I think in places where you have a good alternative to driving, first you should look at how we reform parking there. Um, before moving on to how can we even make suburban areas more accessible. Uh, I'm curious uh, whether you consider it's worthwhile to explore to separate the parking costs uh, for property requisitions and from, uh, separate them for the high density housing development. Uh, separate the parking versus the unit itself, just like what it was mentioned earlier, because in in Asia, land use is very expensive. In Tokyo, Hong Kong, or Singapore, people can purchase, decide whether I will pur purchase the property with one parking or two parking, and I have the option to lease out my parking spaces. I wonder that kind of parking um, policy, whether it's, how does that proceed? Well, how would that proceed in the U.S.? By, off, by a neighbor? by unbundling parking? Uh, just as earlier you mentioned, probably this kind of reduced the parking required policy would be more applicable in the high transit service uh, frequency corridors. Then the housing along the corridor may be more idea or marketable with the reduced parking spaces. Yeah, you would uh, reduce the parking spaces or even just say you can lease out these spaces to someone else. Um, but then the question is how would the developers accept or how to promote this kind of policy to be considered marketable from the developer's po point of view? Because the developer would prefer to offer parking as an incentive? Uh, that, that's amenity? the general impression of when I first came uh, 20 years ago, I asked the same question, then they say that's the requirement. Right, and there are definitely a lot of people that are looking for units that come with a parking spot. But I think that we could say, well, those people might also want the choice whether they want to pay for that parking and have that spot or not. And there might be people who would prefer, who don't need it, and who would prefer to have a lower rent by not having to pay for and subsidize everyone else's parking. I guess I'm giving the, the closing remarks, uh, and I'm very aware that I stand between this last hearty group and the weekend. So this is going to be really fast. Um, well, first, so I'm gonna, just going to do two things. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to thank everyone for coming and for putting on, this on, and then I'm going like, to make one remark about transportation research. So two steps. First step, thank you all for coming. And thank you to uh, the Pacific Southwest Region UTC for putting this on, because I do think it's super important um, that we, we sort of have the, our emerging scholars uh, come out and, and present their work and get feedback and everything. And then I think the, the only other thing I'll say, which I think people, it, it occurs to me a lot, and I don't, I don't think it comes up enough, is just that like one of the great things about transportation research, and particularly the kind of transportation research that is promoted by uh, the University Transportation Centers is that it really is supposed to be applied and like what we do is supposed to like be helpful for society um, and that does make us a little bit different than like a lot of what goes on at universities right which is just that like it's probably not the end of the world if you're a professor of like critical modern literature and no one has any idea what you're saying and you don't have any idea what you're saying like that's not ideal, but it's okay. Uh, but like, we really do have an obligation with our work to like try and get things right because people depend on us. And unfortunately, um, we have about the same level as a, of accountability as the people who teach all the other stuff. 
which would say that no one really ever knows if we're wrong. Right? Like, if, if you, for, I'm like a typical academic, which means that I think I'm like, I spend most of my time thinking I'm badly misunderstood and underappreciated and no one, you know, underpaid and overworked. But the fact of the matter is that most people in most jobs um, have this terrible thing that happens where if they're bad at their job, everyone knows it. Right? Like, if you're a car mechanic and like someone comes to get their car from you and it doesn't start, like, they know right away that you've screwed up. Like, we're immune from that. We write these things, we put some slides up, there's some coefficients, maybe they make sense, maybe they don't, everybody thinks we're an expert, we go home. Like, we have terrible private incentives not to get things right. Uh, but when all of us abide by those private incentives, there's huge social costs. Because I don't know if anybody's noticed, but like, transportation in California is a mess. And so I just think that if we, one like, thought I'll leave us all with is it really is on all of us to want on our own to get things right. Um, because no one's going to make us get things right. We're not in that kind of profession. Um, but when we get things wrong, a lot of people pay a cost for it. So uh, go out there and do good work. And enjoy the weekend. Thank you.